Great. Hi, all. Uh, so I am Ben Winters. I'm counsel at the Electronic Privacy Information Center, or EPIC, uh, where I lead our project on AI and human rights. Uh, I'll be moderating this panel today of excellent experts uh, that I'm excited to hear from. During this panel, uh, we're going to be discussing how many tools use both directly in the criminal legal system, like predictive policing, facial recognition tools, risk assessments, and more, and outside of it, like algorithms that help decide loan rates, uh, school eligibility, housing eligibility, and more, are related to each other, occasionally exa further exacerbating the negative effects of any single one system and furthering us from meaningful understanding and accountability. We're going to try to zoom out and consider how advocates uh, can keep this in mind when trying to deal with each system as a problem come up, how the current regulatory scheme anywhere in the world is really not well keyed to handle this dynamic, and what's next. So um, logistically, we're going to hear from each panelist briefly just for about five minutes, then have a guided discussion uh, among the participants and take some questions at the end. So please use the, the public chat for Q&A throughout. We'll work it in and, and make sure to take questions at the end. Um, but for now, I'm going to introduce each panelist and then hand it off to them for their short talks. Uh, so first, we're going to have Silky Carlo who's the executive director of Big Brother Watch UK. Uh, Clarence Oko, who's the civil rights legal fellow at NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And Dr. Nakima Steffelbauer, who's the CEO at Frauenloop. So uh, for now, I will hand it off to Silky to uh, present briefly. Great. Thank you so much, Ben. And uh, it's wonderful to be in this session with you and with Clarence and Nakima also. Uh, it's, a real, it's a real pleasure. Um, I want to talk about some work that we've been doing in uh, the UK uh, on a particular algorithm in criminal justice. Um, at the outset, actually, I just want to check if I have slides coming through, uh, hopefully so, because then I can make reference uh, just to a couple of pictures, but it's actually not essential. Um, but if they're coming through, that's great. Um, Meanwhile, uh, just to let you know, uh, I'm the director of Big Brother Watch. Big Brother Watch is a cross-party non-profit campaign organisation. Um, in the UK, we work to protect rights and liberties, particularly in the context of growing technological change. Um, so the algorithm that I want to talk about uh, briefly in the time that I have is an interesting one because um, you will see multi the, the, the multi-layered uh, possibilities for harm and discrimination uh, in this tool, um, which is um, which we're going to come on to. First of all, I just want to show you. Um, so my opening slide, I've taken a screenshot here from a film called Coded Bias, which is a documentary um, that I really recommend you see. It features some of Big Brother Watch's work um, monitoring and fighting police use of facial recognition. And in this photo, um, it, it, it kind of almost looks like and, and on the ground, it looks like a bunch of men just jumped this poor kid. Um, but actually, they are plain clothed police officers. Um, and the boy on the far left, um, whose face is blurred out, was misidentified by police facial facial recognition. Uh, the police there are actually trying to take a fingerprint from him. <laughs> he was completely innocent schoolboy, aged 14 years old. Um, and that was a really horrendous uh, incident. I'm sure we're going to talk more, more about facial recognition, so I, I'm not going to talk too much about that. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. So this is what I, I want to talk about. It's a system called HEART, um, which is the Harm Assessment Risk Tool. It was used by a police force in the UK by Durham Police, um, which uh, is an in-house machine learning algorithm that profiles suspects. So this is before anyone has been uh, charged, certainly not convicted of any crime whatsoever. Um, it profiles suspects to predict their risk of reoffending. This is before you know if they even have offended. Um, it's, an, it, it's an AI generated risk score that's used to advise whether uh, the police should charge the suspect or release them onto her rehabilitation program. So this is um, an AI tool that's involved in making clearly what could be quite a life-changing decision for an individual, whether they're gonna be put through the criminal justice system or whether they're gonna receive support. And that's based on how likely they think it is that this person is gonna reoffend before they've even been convicted of anything whatsoever. 
Um, we uh, there was not much pu publicity around this. We investigated it and found that there were two variables going into the system that were both postcode variables. One was a straightforward uh, half of that person's postcode, and the other um, is a postcode identifier based on commercial marketing data from Experian, the big credit scoring agency, um, and they have a uh, geo demographic segmentation tool known as Mosaic, which is uh, for anyone who isn't familiar with this, it's a very prolonged way of saying stereotyping based on your postcode. And I think all of us can imagine, or based on our own postcodes, what kind of assumptions might be made, and quite often those assumptions would be wrong. And even if they're right. <laughs> um, the product of what happens in this system is 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 clearly problematic. Um, so Mosaic consists of postcode stereotypes built on 850 million pieces of data. And that data spans health data, exam results, child benefits, income support, uh, names. Names are scanned for um, uh, the, the likelihood that they relate to ethnicities. Uh, data scraped from online sources, and an awful lot more. And the tool is used to profile all 50 million adults in the UK into each of these stereotypes. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Some of these stereotypes are particularly, sorry, it's very small, uh, but I'm going to explain. Um, some of these stereotypes are incredibly crude. I mean, they all are, but some are just ridiculous. Um, and bear in mind, again, this is based on postcode. So they built these profiles. For example, one was called Asian Heritage. Another was called Disconnected Youth. Uh, since our investigation, some of those names have now been changed, um, but they're just euphemisms for the same kind of stereotype. And so Experian attributes demogra demographic characteristics to each stereotype. So for example, uh, their description of Asian heritage is uh, people who live in extended families in inexpensive, I'm qu uh, quoting here, inexpensive, closed packed Victorian terraces. And uh, experience says that when these people do have jobs, they are generally in low paid routine occupations in transport or food service. Let me remind you, this data is going into deciding whether someone is going to go through the criminal justice system or not. Uh, incredibly serious. So it raises new, uh, could you go to the next slide, please? It raises new questions um, about big data and, and privacy. This, this is a, their, their, their uh, long explanation of what Asian heritage is in terms of a postcode variable. Um, <clears throat> and this ra really raises big questions, not only about algorithms in criminal justice, but about how the accumulation of big data can go into building a system like this, that you actually even have um, on sale these kinds of profiling tools in the first place that then authorities can use to kind of retroactively justify some of their practices and the types of people that they target and the way that they, they treat those people. Um, and I think this, this is a particularly interesting case study because it's indicative of the way that authorities in general in the UK are approaching new technologies, algorithms uh, for decision making and artificial intelligence. Uh, could you just go to the next slide, please? And I know I have to wrap up. Um, again, this is very small. So this, this is my attempt <laughs> at a draft model um, to try and understand um, the kind of the uh, impact of, of algorithmic decision making and, and how the harms relate to one another. So I've got data privacy at the center. With all of these systems, you see that it's the loss of privacy and the accumulation of often granular data on all of us that enables subsequent harms. Um, and that affects civil and political rights, socioeconomic rights. I'm sure we'll hear more about some of the welfare systems and algorithms. Um, and discrimination really wraps around all of this. Um, you can find it present at every stage of the process. And ultimately, it's democratic processes and also systems of justice that suffer. Um, I think I'm out of time, but uh, thanks for, I hope that uh, 
whistle stop tour through the heart system uh, was was clear enough, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Um, that was really helpful. Um, and we're going to hand it off to Clarence to to explain a few other systems and and continue the sort of table setting here. Hey, good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me? Great. So my name is Clarence Oko. Uh, you see him pronouns. I am an Equal Justice Works Fellow here at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, where I lead a project uh, that challenges the racialized consequences of emerging technology such as artificial intelligence and machine learning on the civil and human rights of black and brown communities in the United States. Uh, for those of you who, are, who may not be familiar, uh, LDF is one of the nation's oldest civil rights organizations. We pursue litigation and policy advocacy to advance racial justice in the United States. And in recent years, we have uh, developed deep concerns about the emergence of these technologies and their implications on the rights of the communities that we serve. Uh, we're in particular concerned about the development of surveillance uh, technologies by the, uh, used by law enforcement, as well as other carceral technologies that are deployed, um, again, to burden the rights of our communities. Uh, so in collaboration with a number of advocates, activists, attorneys, we have been uh, challenging these practices across a number of jurisdictions in the United States. And in each instance, we try to kind of blend together um, interdisciplinary advocacy strategies, so relying on litigation, policy advocacy, and organizing strategies uh, to advance our work. So I want to spend uh, just a few seconds uh, walking through a couple of examples from some of the work that we've been doing uh, in recent years related to uh, both carceral technologies as well as algorithm discrimination. Um, I actually don't have to do that much of a um, detailed analysis because essentially everything that Silky described as happening in the UK, I mean, I was almost shocked. Like, like, the, like the actual graphs were very similar to what we've seen uh, in some of our work. So I'll describe some of those cases briefly. But uh, at the outset, I just want to make a couple of quick observations that I think are really important to ground the conversation. Um, the first is that the community level consequences of carceral technologies are important and that we can't lose focus. Um, on those consequences. So oftentimes when we discuss um, the impact of carceral technologies, we focus on the threat to partic particular individuals, right? The threat of misidentification from a racial recognition system or the individualized consequences of digital profiling from a predictive policing system. But it's also important to understand that when you aggregate those experiences, there are unique harms that can be surfaced, right? When you look at the kind of uh, impact of those individualized harms at scale. And so in particular, we're concerned about this development of surveillance redlining that is kind of uh, layering on of police surveillance technologies within black and brown communities in the United States essentially operates as a form of containment. Uh, it directs a, a increased interactions between law enforcement and communities of color uh, that reinforces historic patterns that lead, lead to those communities being spatially isolated. Uh, and that is a really important development that I think we want to kind of keep in mind as we're thinking about these technologies. Um, Obviously, the second observation is that these harms are differentiated by race um, and that these technologies are often designed to pursue racial ends, even if they're not intentional. Again, you know, technologies that reinforce the status quo are building upon histories of racial inequality and injustice in the United States. There was a, um, a uh, study conducted by BuzzFeed that examined the prevalence of a uh, certain facial recognition platform being used by law enforcement. I think there were over 2,000 agencies found. Um, to have used the technology. And when we kind of did a quick analysis, we found that almost every jurisdiction that has had a pattern and practice investigation by the Department of Justice uh, for civil, systemic civil rights and constitutional violations, uh, they have been using facial recognition technology, oftentimes unauthorized by the locality that they work in. And finally, um, the two examples I'm going to provide, the first kind of looks at a predictive policing system in Florida the second looks at a uh, fintech lending platform that uses uh, education-related data uh, to feed a machine learning system to price loans for applicants. Uh, these two examples may feel disparate, but what I want to suggest is that the common link between the two is that both of them kind of reinforce this, um, this status of second-class citizenship for black and brown folks. And we kind of see these technologies doing uh, the work that we saw in the early uh, 20th century in the United States, that we're seeing this kind of reemergence of uh, two different systems uh, through which people are able to access opportunity, two different systems through which people are able to access benefits, through which their citizenship um, is being experienced. 
So um, really quickly on the two examples, the first is uh, Pasco County. It's a county down in Florida um, where a Tampa Bay Times investigative report found that the local sheriff's office was working in collaboration with the school district uh, to operate a predictive policing program. The way that the system works is that there's a data sharing agreement whereby the school district provides access to confidential student records, including a student's grades, their discipline records, their attendance records, and others. They grant those documents uh, over to the Pasco County Sheriff's Office. The sheriff then aggregates those data and feeds them through a predictive, poli uh, excuse me, a predictive policing algorithm. The algorithm scores students um, based off of all of those different criteria that I mentioned and labels them as either at risk, off, excuse me, at risk, on track, or off track. Um, and the goal of the program is to try and identify students who the sheriff's office believes uh, is at risk of developing into prolific criminal offenders. Uh, based off of our kind of cursory, um, I won't say cursory, based off of our work that we've been doing over the last year and a half uh, in PASCO, what we have, um, what we've arrived at is a concern that the practices that they are engaged in down in PASCO are having a disparate impact on black and brown youth. Uh, low-income youth and youth with disabilities. And often that is driven by the fact uh, that the data that they're relying upon are all racially biased and skewed. Um, so that's what's happening in Pasco, and I'm happy to provide additional details as we kind of continue the conversation. Really quickly on Upstart, um, Upstart, as I mentioned before, is a fintech company that provides loan services. Um, they, they do so by relying on alternative data, um, so non-traditional criteria to determine credit worthiness. Um, and they do that, they feed that data into their kind of proprietary uh, machine learning system. And they use the combination of the two to actually price loans. We have a partner organization, the Student Borrower Protection Center, that ran an analysis of uh, Upstart's lending platform and found that there were uh, deep concerns uh, related to the ways in which the lending platform was treating students who attended historically black colleges and universities versus students who were attending predominantly white institutions. Uh, over the course of the life of a loan, uh, students who are attending HBCUs could be charged hundreds, if not thousands, of more dollars um, than uh, students who are attending PWIs. So what we were able to do is enter into a two-year monitoring agreement with Upstart um, to essentially conduct a kind of fair lending analysis of their algorithm to understand, uh, have a better understanding about the fair lending implications of their platform. Uh, but I will stop there because um, I know I'm probably over the five-minute limit, uh, five limit, and I will turn it over to the king. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure if my slide is going to be presented. It is great. If it's not, that's also fine, and I'll try to be mindful of the time as I quickly go through the points that I wanted to uh, cover. Um, first, I'm Nikima Steferbawa. I am a digital transformation um, executive or survivor, depending on how you look at it. I'm also the founder and um, CEO of Frauenloop, which is a nonprofit computer programming school for resident EU immigrant and refugee status women here in Berlin. So, in addition to what Silky and Clarence have been discussing, one of the fact that there is a significant interest amongst law enforcement agencies to uh, rely on these um, automated decision making or performing risk assessments and determining uh, what and, uh, the circumstances which is acceptable to target and surveil people. But they're really doing on these algorithmic solutions outside of law enforcement with the same approach to human classification. I wanted to give the examples uh, that I list in the slide. I'm going to start from the bottom because some of the more interesting um, ways that this same type of targeting is, has been taking place include the education sector, which as everyone has been struggling with the pandemic and all the disruption that is created such that we have two really um, striking examples from 2020 where there were high profile cases that had the sector private actor rely on automated decision making software for great assessments. I'm speaking specifically the UK um, higher education boards 
responsible for administering the A level leave their leave exemptions and the international board organization that's in Geneva, Sweden, that administers the I exam to secondary school graduates uh, worldwide. In those two cases in 2020, what we saw was um, actors who outsourced the traditional um, grade assessment process for final examinations of high schoolers to external parties that customized algorithms to rank and to issue grading um, decisions for students in 2020. What it turned out that happened was that vast numbers of students received unexpected and disparate grades from their predicted scores. And upon investigation, it was discovered that the historical average performances of the school institutions, which many of these students had attended, was being used in both cases, in the UK case, as well as in the international baccalaureate case, to issue grades that were more historical grades from the district schools that students had been attending rather than their actual performance on the tests. This led to thousands of students globally who paid the IB program and students in the UK who sat for A-level exams in 2020, either receiving grades that did not correspond to their achievement level and or losing scholarships in cases where they'd been offered university places that were dependent on receiving a certain score. And in many European cases, this led to students being denied entry to a whole area of study that required certain grades to be achieved in these final exams in order for to participate. In the UK case, we showed students to play under resourced, underperforming rules their scores on average on grade. Students were attending well reduced higher performing schools did not know. This is a really good example, one good example of how critical algorithmic use scale is very often in of Another example is with regard to added um, uh, and automated decision making algorithms on sites. I'm specifically interested in this because of the lack of transparency that is that abounds when it comes to employment and algorithmic ranking um, software. We don't know, for example, on any major job search professional networking platform you can think of. We don't know how people are treated based on having gaps, having incarceration, having any number of types of information present on their resume of former employment. And we also don't know what impact characteristics such as age, characteristics such as photographs, um, names that are in any way identifiable with race or ethnicity are treated by ranking algorithms and the Buying software that is powering how these platforms work. To then give a name, where you can go through and check to see how many of the other candidates on a particular platform, with or without a geographic train, are working in gig work or working in um, precarious circumstances. Um, it's extremely interesting to think about the degree of information that we don't have and how that may affect our ranking and how employers and others who deal with these employment sites engage with that information and the rankings that may ensue based on a wealth of information that we're not quite sure um, how is integrated into these ranking systems. Similarly to this type of hidden or intransparent, let's say, um, software, there's the um, situation that I wanted to point out, which is um, stores and businesses. 
in the commercial sense, businesses are under just as much pressure as law enforcement is to rely more and more on algorithmic and analytic analysis of their customers. What this has turned into in the case of um, two companies that were featured in an expose article in Wired last year um, was that they're not only in-store, not, not only online, but also in-store analytics that are being sold and evidently are being um, hyped as ways to understand who is shopping at your uh, bricks and mortar locations by means of attribute estimation, which involves algorithmic determination of everything, age, gender, to emotions, and also allegedly racial or ethnic identity. With a view to the time, I won't continue, um, but I want to make the point that um, all of this to say we're playing whack-a-mole in some sense with different sectors that are using automated decision-making software to target to classify, to get to know, to understand different sectors of society. And based on this generalized aggregated data that all of these organizations, companies, entities tend to use, um, as Clarence said earlier, we're very often seeing reproduction of exclusionary and discriminatory practices uh, from the past. Thank you, Nikki Men, and thank you to <clears throat> all of you for, for really setting the table uh, and explaining some of these systems, giving some more in-depth examples, um, because it can be really difficult to, you know, adequately tell all the different stories of the systems we want to talk about and how they're connected. Uh, but I think it's, you know, obviously necessary to at least get that baseline. Uh, so to start off going a little bit deeper, uh, Clarence, can you talk um, about sort of the individualized harms that each tool might produce. I mean, you can't go for every single tool, but you talked a little bit about how the how the FinTech um, sort of alternative data has, has disparate effects on black communities and how, you know, policing algorithms do that. So if you could give like a little bit of sample of how some of those harms uh, individually, but also sort of compounded between systems, uh, I think that would be really helpful moving forward. Yeah, so I think that there's a, a couple of good examples that can maybe ground some of this, but um, to just begin, you know, as Ben was saying, we see a variety of um, police surveillance technologies and other carceral technologies being used in jurisdictions around the United States. So this is everything from, you know, common examples like predictive policing and facial recognition, but other technologies like automated license plate readers, aerial surveillance systems. I think last year, uh, the New York, New York City Police Department rolled out um, robot dogs. These are like terrestrial surveillance systems that uh, assisted them um, in doing a variety of who knows what. Um, and I think to what you know Ben was saying, there's both the kind of individualized harm. So we've seen examples of, uh, we've seen really tragic examples of the individualized consequences of these technologies. So for example, we know of cases out of Michigan where facial recognition misidentification has led to uh, black two, at least two black men being, um, you know, falsely incarcerated, falsely jailed uh, based off of those misidentifications. We also know, uh, for example, with Adam Toledo in Chicago, uh, a young young man of color, 14 years old, I believe, who was killed by the Chicago Police Department um, and was deployed, the Chicago Police Department was deployed to his neighborhood because of a shot spotter detection system that said that there was some gunshot that had gone off in this community. Um, so we see the kind of lethal and the violence, violent potential that these technologies can have with respect to um, individuals. We also see it not just in the, you know, the peer policing context, but also when it, with respect to public accommodation. So there was another example out of Detroit of a young teenage girl um, who was kicked out of a, of a skating rink because she had been misidentified by a facial recognition system um, that said that she was on a list of people who should have been excluded from uh, the, the, the rink. There are also um, a number of examples of retailers that are using facial recognition technology in similar ways. So we see it both in the policing context and in the uh, commercial sense as well. But there's a kind of larger concern about the interoperability of these systems. Um, so a good example of this has been some research by immigration advocates in the United States that have looked at the impact of data brokers. These are companies that kind of take and aggregate uh, a whole bunch of different data sets, including like utility data, um, and use that information, package it up, and sell it to law enforcement agencies to be able to go about 
um, and do their business, including immigration enforcement. Um, so these technologies, data brokers, are bringing together these disparate forms of data, um, using all of these different systems that are able to identify and surveil people to facilitate law enforcement purposes. Um, and then there's the, 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 the uh, dynamic I was mentioning earlier with respect to the second-class citizenship. So when you look at technologies that facilitate algorithmic discrimination, right, this kind of um, use of these technologies to reinforce existing historic patterns of discrimination, you're seeing, uh, what you're seeing is a process that renders communities um, vulnerable to the effects of economic inequality and economic precarity, and that that precarity is really essential, right, to sustaining the ability of law enforcement to target, surveil, um, and criminalize these communities and perpetuate patterns of police violence and mass incarceration directed at black and brown communities. Um, so I think along those dimensions, you can kind of get a good sense of all the different ways that uh, carceral technologies are really showing up and impacting our communities. And the last thing I'll say is, um, I think it's really important to kind of place these technologies within a particular historical context. Um, in particular, police surveillance technologies really kind of find their, their origin story um, in uh, chattel slavery, right? That many of the surveillance techniques, the ideas that um, animate surveillance technologies today were really kind of developed and pioneered during the antebellum period. So scholars like Simone Brown have looked at exam for examples like uh, lantern laws in New York City um, that required uh, enslaved people and black people to uh, have lanterns up to their faces at nighttime so that uh, any white person could be able to identify them, right? Seeing that as kind of one of the first processes in which we're... Um, you can see facial recognition kind of being developed. Um, similar, uh, similar things are true with techniques like branding and others that are designed to try and make black folks visible, render us visible, render us subject to surveillance um, at any given time. And so, again, the historical context is also really essential in grounding um, how we're thinking about how these technologies are impacting individuals and communities today. Thank you, Clarence. Um... That, I appreciate that answer. Um, so, uh, Silky, I'd I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you know, sort of building off of of what's what Clarence is talking about, how these systems are are being layered onto sort of systems of systemic oppression throughout throughout time. How how do the both criminal justice and law enforcement use, but also sort of tools outside of the system that uh, several of you have have highlighted. Um, exacerbate and and prey upon particular populations, particularly um, black and brown populations, but also just um, low income populations in general. Um, and, and how did that sort of drive uh, a sort of an outsized impact on 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 folks in in throughout their life? Thanks. Well, it's a really good question, <laughs> and I think we are um, on the brink of trying to understand the answer more in the UK. Um, one of the big problems that we have is a total lack of transparency. I think this is a common problem, but I mean, it's incredibly hard to find how people's lives are being affected by ever more obscure and opaque systems. Um, we made a, a first attempt uh, to look at uh, in welfare and social care, some of the algorithmic decision making, kind of big data related tools that are being used, which I'm going to post the link to um, in the chat. It's a report called Poverty Panopticon. Um, and it's interesting how you know, we, we did find some examples of where the line between care and uh, criminalization is very blurred um, with some of these systems. And um, for example, some of you might have heard of the Gangs Matrix database, uh, which was used by the Metropolitan Police here in London. Um, and this ostensibly was something that was kind of like a, an, an it, it, I mean, it is a, an intelligence database of uh, basically young black male children, um, overwhelmingly in London. Um, many of whom have never been involved in violent crime. And the way that the police justified it is through the lens of safeguarding and care, which is not a role for the police um, and not how it works in practice. In practice, it means that these boys are targeted, um, sometimes threatened with school exclusion or even loss of their homes um, and all, all kinds of sanctions and penalties affecting their lives. Um, we found a similar system in our research that, again, was run by a council, this time not police. 
um, but is very similar. Um, and again, is trying to predict criminality in primarily young boys from minority groups. Um, and it's interesting how these predictive algorithms, of course, are always leveled at poor people um, to uh, to predict criminality um, and not, you know, in Canary Wharf in the city or in Downing Street, where there seems to be a lot of it at the moment. Um, so, yes, yeah, certainly you can see that the uh, the power imbalances are as they always are. And the use of these opaque systems um is certainly overlapping now between criminality, social care and welfare. The problem that we face, what we're up against in the UK, is that it's not clear yet exactly what the impacts are and how that's happening. Um, and of course, we're supposed to have the right to know if we have been subjected to a purely automated decision. Under GDPR, we're supposed to, uh, under the UK Data Protection Act, we are supposed to have the right to be informed of that. The best of my knowledge, and I think anyone else who works on UK data rights here, no one has ever been informed that they've been subjected to a purely automated decision. I mean, it's like a fictional data right that doesn't really work in practice because if you have an administrator or someone in a bureaucratic position or an officer who agrees with an outcome of, a, uh, of an algorithm, then in the view of the bureaucrats, it's not purely automated. It's a human decision informed by a computer. Um, and so digging into this is really tough. Equally, when some of these young boys in London were getting letters that were threatening them with some of these kinds of punishments and sanctions, um, and it turned out they were on the gang's matrix, a lot of them didn't know. And that comes back as well to, I think, what Clarence was saying about community impact. When a whole community starts to realise and feel that they are being watched and, you know, statements are exchanged like I'm probably on the database or they've probably targeted me for this reason or that reason. Uh, people develop the, the view and sadly, quite rightly, that they are targeted and treated differently and disadvantaged by structures of power that they have no control over and actually can't even see feel or touch they're just as subjected to them um so that's what i think why it's, it's so important um and the transparency is so important because we still know so little in terms of uh, so some of the systems that are being used in the uk yeah definitely i think i think a little bit related to the the some of the reasoning why there's not significant transparency information about this uh is that sort of the harms are felt on the the folks that are already uh, you know, most powerless and 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 marginalized. Um, Nakima, can you talk a little bit about uh, that sort of dynamic? That since since the fact that uh, these harms are most felt on on those already marginalized, that they are not centered, they are not considered, and and solutions to them, and not solutions, but interventions uh, are are not meaningfully made. Absolutely, I think the the main thing to keep in mind is that we're dealing with um, different kinds of pressure on the administrative side, the governmental side to appear more digitally savvy and to incorporate as much um, time and money optimizing software as possible in their um, general administration of benefits and of um, all kinds of public services. And at the same time, you have the groups that typically uh, feel the impact first, the negative impact of these technologies, and they are groups like um, under 18s who are subjected to, you know, mass experimentation with algorithmic grading because there's no lobby, because there's no obvious defense against uh, these groups being targeted in this way. Um, there's uh, the most obvious outcome of using any type of surveillance or analytics software in real time on um, either the streets in Greece or in stores and shops throughout the EU is that the people who are going to be flagged and the people who research shows are going to feel unwelcome, um, threatened, and potentially brought to the attention of uh, law enforcement are the people who are at the margins, who are not pertaining to the majority 
populations and the people who are also, as a result of that, least likely to demand to know for what purpose they are being filmed or uh, their information is being retained and, and this type of thing. So I think it, it's partly um, an encouraging factor, at least in the EU context, so that we do have um, GDPR in place that we are hoping to have soon um, a definitive biometric surveillance ban. The reality, though, is how do we get from these high level um, protections that are understood in concept by many that no one seems under any compulsion to implement when it comes time to determine what types of information, what types of um, dashboards or analytics will you collect about your customers, about um, your community, if you're policing it, and what are the requirements of basic human rights when it comes to making determinations about people's future opportunities based on aggregated data that has nothing to do with individuals. Thank you. Um, and just, just watching the clock, um, things are definitely flying by. So I want to move um, a little bit towards, um, you know, what's what's being done and what, what can be done. How can advocates sort of approach this with this dynamic in mind that um, this is all sort of layered on top of sort of, you know, matrices of di domination and, and power imbalances and, and exacerbating um, all sorts of, of uh, marginalizations. Uh, and so I think with the understanding that we're having a discussion that's relevant to almost every country and every jurisdiction, but obviously has a little bit of, of, of differences uh, in each, you know, country or, or state or city, you know, especially that's the, that's the case in the U.S., um, what can can each of you maybe give an example of a law or or a regulatory action or uh, you know if the government's failed at at, at every point, which is understandable, a grassroots sort of action that was successful um, that sort of took into account uh, adequately or at least you know in a cursory extent uh, this sort of broader um, connectivity between these systems. Um, and so, so I'll I'll start I'll start with asking Clarence, um, and would love everyone to 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 hit on this, and especially Nakima in the in the EU. I'd love for you to talk about how uh, you know the potential uh, risk based approach in the EU AI Act, which the last event really dove into a lot, might be able to to cover this adequately. Yeah, so, I mean, as Ben was mentioning, you know, the U.S. is really um, the problem child uh, when it comes to um, a lot of um, these questions about building policy solutions. Um, we have a very kind of fragmented approach to protecting um, individual privacy, as well as just kind of safeguarding civil and human rights generally, but especially in our relationship to these emerging technologies. Um, so I will give an example. Um, I got two quick examples, I think, that show kind of the different approaches um, that communities are taking to begin to develop some type of regulatory um, regime over these technologies. And the reason why I'm going to give these two examples is because I think in the United States, um, the prospects of federal legislation um, anytime soon is, is pretty dim, at least federal legislation that would, I think, uh, be as ambitious as many of the folks uh, in this conversation would like to see. Uh, but in the absence of that kind of federal oversight, um, there are you know, uh, there is movement happening at the local level and state level. So, for example, um, a coalition down in New Orleans two years ago, I believe now at this point, uh, came together um, after a series of investigative reports that found that the New Orleans Police Department had routinely lied about their use of facial recognition and other biometric surveillance technologies. Um, and so the coalition came together and drafted an ordinance that not only banned facial recognition uh, in the city of New Orleans, but also... Uh, set a ban for predictive policing and set up this kind of process where uh, the New Orleans Police Department would have to um, essentially have democratic pre-authorization before they can implement any new surveillance technology. So it's one of the most robust and comprehensive uh, measures that we've seen from a locality um, attempting to try and regulate the, the uh, use of police surveillance technologies. Obviously, the, the law wasn't everything that the advocates, uh, the coalition's name was Eyes on Surveillance. Um, it's not everything that they wanted. Um, they, the model bill that they presented was more ambitious, included more categorical bans on various surveillance technologies, but it represents um, the kind of progress that I think a lot of jurisdictions 
would like to see replicated. Uh, another example is, is through the courts, and this has been a far more perilous path, um, but there are examples of success. So one example we're familiar with the LDF um, is in Baltimore. Um, the city of Baltimore uh, had piloted an aerial surveillance, uh, aerial surveillance system. It's kind of a dragnet aerial surveillance program where they had drones that flew over the city um, at 24 hours a day, seven days a week, gathering data um, on uh, all the civilians. I think it was like 90% of people could be surveilled by this um, aerial surveillance system. Um, there were a group of community organizers that came together and worked with the uh, ACLU of Maryland to bring, a lit bring litigation challenging that aerial surveillance, saying that it was a violation of uh, the Fourth Amendment. Um, after uh, rounds of litigation, they were able to actually achieve a really landmark decision by um, the Fourth Circuit, holding that uh, the city's use of that aerial surveillance technology actually was violative of the Fourth Amendment. And so they are currently, uh, well, the, the litigation actually pressured the city to abandon the program altogether. Um, and it was just a really kind of landmark case. And so it shows, again, you know, in the absence of federal legislation, there are alternative routes that um, communities and advocates can pursue um, to try and build policy solutions. Yeah, Nikima, if you can talk a little bit about um, sort of how you see the EUA Act being able to, um, you know, adequately attack these issues. Well, the EU Act is um, taking a risk-based approach, which is uh, categorizing the different types of risks that are involved in public deployment of large-scale um, algorithmic decision-making systems, and also it takes the position of banning certain specific uses um, entirely. Um, the good side of the AI Act is that it is uh, some type of framework. It provides some type of guidance with regard to what will, at a, at a minimum, require um, audits and evaluation if a system is implemented that's categorized and it falls under the high-risk categorization. Um, what's not so great about um, a high-level legislation of this type is that you still have to ensure that at all levels of administration, law enforcement, and the general public, that the rights and privileges that it protects are understood and can be therefore um, defended at the community and individual level. And right now, I would say, just based on the fact that there is such a heavy uh, rel reliance on audits, ex post facto in some case, um, audits for fairness and bias, um, there's a very long road ahead to refining this legislation such that it's actually usable, understandable, and defensible in courts and um, defensible in a way across the various EU localities. Thanks. Um, and, and, oh, my God. And, and Soki, uh, if you have an example uh, briefly that you'd, you'd like to share that you think would be, you know, one sort of example, example uh, of, of an intervention or, or, or anything like that, please, please go ahead. But if not, we can move on. Well, thanks. I mean, I think this is the most important question is why we're all here, isn't it? And uh, uh, there's no one single way. I mean, every all the ways that have been discussed and that we've tackled different kinds of issues uh, within this scope um, are, are all really important. And I share uh, Clarence's, uh, you know, uh, just that... Um, you know the uncertainty of of, of legal challenges um, on on these issues with algorithmic decision making. There's all, always the risk, of course, of setting an, a negative precedent. Um, this is so new, and you're you know, I, maybe it's particularly here. I don't know, but you know, you're asking quite an archaic system to grapple with um, totally novel concepts. Um, and they are not sympathetic in general. And, and again, the opacity is an issue. Uh, we just tried to um, bring a legal challenge against uh, a, 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 an element of the welfare system um, where we think 
an algorithm an algorithm was was involved in people not being paid correctly um and because we don't have any evidence and we can't force that uh, evidence to come out you're shooting in the dark it's really really hard um so it, it depends, you know, and I think when we're talking about algorithms in the welfare system, for example, what you really need is a claimant and you need a claimant who's willing to do lots of subject access requests, get all of their data, have someone rifle through it. I don't know anyone on welfare that would be willing to do that. And I have to say, you know, you you can understand why. I'm talking about people who are in precarious, vulnerable situations um, where the system is designed to to punish you. Um, and, and I know that's not that might sound dramatic i mean it's supposed to be a support net but also all of these algorithms are designed to uh, with suspicion in mind the underlying suspicion is that everyone in receipt of welfare is committing fraud or could be committing fraud and so in those circumstances the expectation that people are going to be able to challenge and this is like a david and goliath thing um but it's, it's not courage enough courage is not enough um, you know, it's not even about courage at all. It's about the fact that the system is so so stacked. So that's something we've got to grapple with. The, the transparency is the most important thing. The, the positive outcome of the um, heart investigation that we did is that actually, um, first of all, when we published that investigation, the mosaic variable was taken out. Um, so those crude post postcode stereotypes were taken out of the system. And subsequently, the whole system has been dropped. But I suspect it's going to come back. I and mean, it's the same with facial recognition. You know, we've had moratoriums, we've had pauses, and I think they're probably gathering their strength and are going to come back. Some of these companies saying, don't worry, we fixed the discrimination problem um, <laughs> because they're looking at it through this really narrow algorithmic lens about um, how the algorithm in isolation performs. And that will get better over time. But then we've got a, just a different iteration of a very similar problem because as we've discussed discrimination runs through um and the harms run through every stage of this process um where uh marginalized people are routinely um targeted by by authorities or um denied basic rights and sustenance um so sometimes i think legal challenges work transparency is the most important thing and sometimes it's grassroots um and i think uh, international solidarity is really important too. I mean, the connections that uh, groups have had, uh, Big Brother Watch included, with groups all around the world on facial recognition, um, we that matters so much because when we sit in meetings with politicians, we can point to the US and we can point to you know, countries all around the world and the kind of backlash that uh, is happening in all kinds of different um, places. Um, and educating i think uh, at a grassroots level about the the future risks before it's too late because of course once the horse is bolted and once you have something like facial recognition used by every police force which is something that we've genuinely faced a few years ago and still face i mean it's a, just a prolonged threat one police force just a couple of weeks ago now has handheld facial recognition on phones so they can just point and and scan someone um with that's we have to not get there because once we've gotten to that stage, I fear that it will be too late. So we have to we have to have a kind of uh, entrepreneurial and multi pronged approach. Uh, and there's not enough of us. <laughs> there are too many of these issues coming up and not enough time, not enough people. I absolutely wanted to, yeah, I wanted to add on to that. I absolutely agree that the solidarity aspect is super important. It's especially important when we're looking at different outcomes in different geographies. Um, if you go back to, uh, or even before, um, the Dutch social benefits case that ended up bringing down the Dutch government um, around the discriminatory use in court to be um, a violation of privacy and fundamental human rights. Um, same scenario, um, social welfare recipients were being targeted based on an algorithm that took into consideration or took into undue consideration their nationality, their, their um, the size of their families, et cetera, um, and essentially was proven to be victimizing uh, certain groups over others and ultimately 
predatory in its approach to social welfare recipients in general. Um, I think that there's absolutely a need to be conscious of and to try to create some high bar uh, across different geographies of the use of these algorithms in the future. And so alongside of the transparency demand, there needs to be more awareness, I believe, of the risks of relying on the appearance of modernity and the appearance of agility and flexibility in um, introducing new technology, the handheld uh, scanners that are being used. I hope not in the UK. I hope it's the Greek case that I was referring to. But if 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 not, then here again, we have, you know, what's happening in the UK is happening in Greece and presumably in other parts of the world where um, people are just so excited to innovate in the ways that technology is utilized in the public space. But that means that, you know, these experiments are happening at scale. And that means that even in the case I wanted to just quickly go back to that Clarence mentioned, um, these innovative, non-traditional types of information that are being used as part of an algorithmic assessment, you know, very often that sounds good and it sounds like a departure from the old ways of doing things. But when you discover that the non-traditional data that's being collected about subjects to make an assessment of risk, um, credit worthiness or whatever it is, are data points such as how you scored on standardized tests, what um, the brand recognition is of your employer, um, how high you reached at whatever level in employment, you realize that actually it's just an excuse to collect even more invasive data about people who don't have a choice in the collection. And it often ends up being just a smokescreen for a greater and greater overreach in the public, in this public space. Ben, I cannot hear you. I'm afraid I can still not hear you. Might be my own issue. No, I can't hear you either. Okay, then you can try to simply refresh. My best advice would be to refresh the page simply and get back. While we wait. Yeah, um, I want there any questions in the chat. Let's see, equitable way of making automated decision making systems. Yeah, so um, I guess just a couple of like, quick concluding thoughts and kind of responding to one of the questions that was raised. Um, I do think that, you know, I don't think that the uh, development of technology and civil rights are fundamentally incompatible, right? But I think that the interests that motivate um, a lot of the companies that are developing the technologies and many of the jurisdictions that are adopting them um, are very much rooted in, at the very least, um, a deep-seated investment in the status quo, which... Uh, features all of the inequalities that we discussed today. And so I think, you know, as we're thinking about the kind of future of um, the relationship between science and technology um, as society, we have to look at the past. And I think we have to really interrogate, specifically looking back at the kind of late 19th century, early 20th century, with the advent of scientific racism um, and the use of these pseudoscientific theories like Drake to mania, for example. Um, this is a phenomenon that was developed by one of the country's leading uh, medical pioneers uh, that suggested that uh, enslaved people had a um, impulse. They had this kind of disorder that would cause them to want to flee, and that the medical uh, the medical diagnosis, the way that you treated uh, Drake to mania, was by beating uh, and whipping people. That that was how you treated Drake to mania, um, and we see that these kind of same, you know, just baseless um, theories are undergirding many of the technologies that are shaping black and brown people's lives today. Um, and you can see the ways in which, you know, ideas like phrenology and physiognomy are really, re, you know, reimagining themselves in facial recognition and affect recognition, technologies being used both, as we described, in the law enforcement context, but also 
um, in the social welfare context, right, to facilitate access to employment opportunities, to credit, and to others. And so I think we really have to um, kind of return to our cornerstone, which is civil and human rights and um, democratic governance as the anchors as we think about developing uh, these technologies and really reimagining um, the, the role that uh, public oversight can and must play in ensuring that the development of these technologies proceed along the lines of civil and human rights. Um, the last thing I'll say is, you know, one of the things that our executive director talks about um, frequently in this context is how digital spaces kind of reimagine public space. And that in the 1950s and 60s in the United States, there was a civil rights revolution to reimagine how black people could exist in public spaces, to challenge, you know, the practices of Jim Crow and segregation um, and racial uh, apartheid in the United States. And that the result of that struggle, the result of many people who had to die for uh, that struggle was our kind of modern civil rights infrastructure in the United States. And that it is quite alarming that as these digital, uh, as the digital public is being reimagined in real time, uh, there's this kind of impulse to try and keep and prevent civil and human rights uh, victories from coming in and shaping how those digital publics will exist. So, um, yeah, so I think that, you know, that's our task is to figure out how can we make sure that our, our digital environment, our digital lives uh, reflect the norms that we have established over the last century uh, to protect the interests of, of all of our communities.